Hi, Rebecca Zung here with you today, top 1% divorce attorney and the best-selling author of the books, Negotiate Like You Matter, and Breaking Free, a step-by-step -step divorce guide. And I help thousands of people just like you go from drama, trauma, and chaos to step into lives of freedom, possibility, prosperity, and purpose. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to my channel, do that right now, hit that notification bell. This is part one of a two-part episode in which I have a conversation with the incredible Tina Swithin, who founded One Mom's Battle. She went through a divorce from a narcissist on her own and caught the attention of Christy Brinkley. And she grew like crazy after that. She's gonna tell you her story and how she did it and how she navigated the court system and won by herself because she couldn't afford an attorney. And joining us for this conversation is Dr. Romani, who's the foremost authority on uh, narcissism and expert on narcissism in the world. I've done quite a few videos with her and she's joining me with Tina Swithin for this unbelievable conversation today. So this is part one. You're gonna wanna make sure you hit subscribe so that when I upload part two, that you'll be um, notified and make sure you watch all the way to the end so that when you watch part two, you will be all caught up on where we were. So without further ado, let's dive into part one. Well, I'm so excited to be here today with, um, I'm Rebecca Zung, we have Dr. Romani, we have Tina Swithin, and we're going to be talking today about one mom's battle and divorcing a narcissist without a lawyer. And we have Tina Swithin, who founded One Mom's Battle, who is absolutely incredible, um, who figured out how to navigate the system on her own. And I'll let her tell about herself. And Dr. Romani, who is the foremost authority expert in the world on narcissism, who's a lic licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, and we have me, who's um, a top 1% divorce attorney and also uh, do quite a lot with narcissism and how to divorce a narcissist and negotiate with a narcissist. So, um, so Tina, why don't you go ahead and start with your background and your story? Okay. So, and, and something I don't normally talk about, my life actually started in the family court system. Um, when I was six months old, my parents went through a divorce, and back in the 70s, moms automatically got, can, got custody. Um, and my mom actually had mental health conditions that made her an unhealthy parent. So when I was six, a little over six months old, my dad won custody of me. And he and I grew up together because he was only 19 at the time. Really? And yes. Wow. And so, yeah. And so, you know, I bring a, you know, a, a different perspective to it. You know, I've always been very pro healthy parent um, based on my own experience in life. Um, but then I, you know, as a 26 year old girl, thought I was making all the right choices. I met this knight in shining armor, um, just overwhelmed me with gifts and trips and compliments and flowers. And, you know, it was just this whirlwind romance, which I had never experienced before. And in my mind, I thought, wow, this is what it's like to date an adult, a man, <laughs> where I had had, you know, younger relationships prior to that. So, um, it wasn't as rosy as it presented itself to be in the beginning. We got married very quickly. It was a very fast and, and quick um, courtship and marriage. And I remember about seven years into my marriage, we had had two daughters and they were really little at the time. They were just under two and four. Um, and I, you know, was I, I remember saying to my husband at the time, I've never felt so alone in my life. And I didn't know how to make sense of it. And he had me questioning, you know, my own sanity, you know, and he would constantly say, you know, your mom suffered from mental health issues. That's why you cry, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, for me, and I would bounce it off people who knew me, you know, they were saying, no, when you cry, it's because 
you know, somebody died or <laughs> these are normal, like, you know, your emotions are not abnormal. But, um, and then I found out that we were in debt to the tune of $1.6 million. Wow. We had, our entire life was a facade. I found out, um, you know, my world turned upside down. I grew up, you know, not in that type of lifestyle but with the narcissist what i came to find out is you know image is so important to them and to my ex-husband you know the the huge house in the gated community the fancy cars this lifestyle that we were living that was what he you know that was his image and so when it all came crashing down and i found out that he had been borrowing against our house and borrowing from people. And uh, it was just, I couldn't even grasp that dollar amount. <laughs> um, I ended up in a therapist office. First, I begged him to go to therapy with me. And, and he said, you are the one with problems. You go see a therapist. <laughs> and so I said, fine, I'll, you know, I'll go work on myself. And I remember sitting there and talking to this woman for an hour and a half. We went way over my first consult. And she got up, went across the room, brought back a book, opened it up and said, I want you to read this section. And it was narcissistic personality disorder. Wow. And I was just, you know, the fixer in me back then was actually so excited because I thought this is, we now have a label. I now understand everything that has happened and now how do we fix him? And and I'm a loyal person and I see the best in people. And so I'm a perfect target. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, she basically told me that day, you don't, you either accept that this is your life and this, there's no fixing this or you leave. And it took a while for that to sink in. It was about another six months. And then he came back at me when he knew I wanted to leave. And he said, listen, find a male PhD and I will agree to go to therapy with you. And I said, I will do anything. And about six months into it, the psychologist said, you know, I think a personality or a psychological examination could be really helpful for us to try to figure out what's going on here. And that was the day my husband said, it's over, we're done. Um, And accused me of manipulating (laughs) the psychologist. And uh, that kind of started our divorce. And, and even in those moments, even though I had seen through him, I had seen behind the mask, I knew what I was up against. I was still so optimistic that, well, first of all, I was probably a little hopeful that because he had never participated in our children's lives, that I didn't understand really what NPD, a narcissistic personality disorder was. And so I was hopeful that he would step up to the plate and actually have a relationship with our daughters and that we could be decent co-parents together because I'm a person who I hate conflict. If you're mad at me, I will stay up all night (laughs) and thinking about it. And so I went in just so naive thinking, we're going to have this great custody arrangement. You know, he's going to have to actually bond with the girls. I didn't realize that wasn't possible. (laughs) And it kind of, you know, as soon as he filed for divorce, um, he was the one that beat me to it. He was actually two people in line in front of me at the window to file. And I'm sitting there watching him do this in line and he doesn't know I'm there. And I'm just, I thought I was going to have a panic attack watching this whole thing take place in front of my eyes. And, you know, it, became World War Three immediately. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. So I ended up, you know, going from my, you know, our whole financial world had crashed down during that time period, lost our home, lost our cars, lost our businesses. And then I had this new fear, which was the fear for my life. And What I quickly came to discover is that domestic violence advocates, you know, they don't, if you will, at least 10 years ago, and and what I still find today, if you haven't been physically abused, 
they don't give it a lot of weight. And so I remember checking myself it's into still that the way. shelter. Like, it's still that way. It is. It's unfortunate. Um, and so I, I, there was one morning things had gotten really badly and I woke up at 6 a.m. to a series of these just crazy voicemails on my phone and packed my little girls in the car and drove to a women's shelter and checked ourselves in. And the most humbling few days of my entire life. And, uh, you know, that kind of started off our journey. Um, and, and even, you know, I remember leaving the women's shelter. I had um, appealed to the court to get exclusive use of the home so that I could go back home and he had to stay out. And he violated that order within 24 hours. And I just knew, you know, this is going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, this, you know, it, I feel like the day that I got my paperwork served, um, the divorce paperwork and that case number, it came with my own personal terrorist. And that's really um, the best way I can describe um, what, what happened. Yeah. I, I mean, there's so many things that I want to say. Um, and I know I was looking at Dr. Romani and she was shaking her head, nodding her head during a lot of what you were saying too. So I, I want her to weigh in on some of this, but um, I want you to just, if you could just highlight for the listeners and the viewers um, about how um, you got the attention of Christy Brinkley, because I think that's a really cool part of your story. And I want to make, make sure you mentioned that early sure. on. So I, I, because of the severe financial abuse that I was experiencing in our marriage, he was able to afford an attorney I could not. And so, you know, I, I went into my custody battle back in 2009 um, in pro per. And a lot of people will say, you know, how, why would you do that? And, you know, I didn't have a choice. You know, I went from a almost $2 million home to driving to a food pantry to feed my daughters. And so buying an attorney or a paying for an attorney was just not in the cards for me. Um, you know, those first couple of days, I looked like a deer in headlights in that courtroom. For the first two years, I looked like a deer in headlights in that courtroom. And, um, you know, it was incredibly difficult. I remember about a year and a half into it, I was just so frustrated. And I remember talking to my dad on the phone one day and he said, march into that courtroom and tell that judge that you are not putting those little girls in the car with him this weekend. He is not safe. And I just thought, you know, nobody gets it. Even the people in my circle who love me and love my kids, nobody understands what I'm up against. And I had such a deep frustration with telling everybody what was happening that I said, I'm going to start a blog. I remember looking at Glenn, my friend back then, I'm married, married to him now. And I remember saying, you know, I, I'm going to start a blog. I'm going to call it one mom's battle because I truly feel like the only person in the entire world going through this. And then friends and family can follow along. I didn't plan for anyone else in the world to read this blog, except my close circle, just so I didn't have to tell the story over and over. And, um, I had been doing that for about six months, happened to be home one day and never, ever watched TV, happened to turn on the TV, Today Show was playing, and Christy Brinkley was being interviewed by Matt Lauer. And it was just off in the distance. I wasn't really paying attention. I'm typing, I'm working, and I hear her, him just berating her and saying, why can't you get along for the sake of the kids? And at that point, I tuned in and went, what is this? And she said, Google the term divorcing a narcissist. And she was choking back tears, which then I started crying because I'm going, this poor woman, I want to, I don't even know who she is. I want to jump through the screen and hug her. Um, that night, my blog, because back then was really one of the only resources available to people going through this situation, um, went from 40 views a month, which was me and my family. <laughs> to literally 40,000 overnight and just from people Googling that term. And then when I woke up the next day, my email was filled with people from all over the world saying, you know, thank you. Thank you for speaking out. We're in, we're sil in silence. We're suffering and, you know, it's isolation. And then a few days later, Christy Brinkley had her assistant contact me 
and invited me down to Los Angeles to meet with her a couple of weeks after that, which I did. And, you know, she basically said, you need to keep speaking, you need to keep telling your story, and I'll support whatever you do and, and help to publicize it and bring it into the light. And so it was shortly after that that I started writing my first book. And um, she was a huge supporter to me you know, she was going through the same thing. And luckily, her daughter is now aged out of the system. Um, but, you know, it goes to show that no matter who you are, rich, poor, you know, it, it doesn't discriminate. This type of issue affects everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's funny, because as I'm hearing you, uh, from the divorce attorney's perspective, tell your story about the kinds of things he started doing right away, as soon as the papers were filed. It's so typical. It's literally, I mean, they're completely predictable in their heinous behavior. Um, and so, um, and we're going to get into more of what the tricks narcissists play, but I want to go back to your very first part of, of your story where you were talking about how you had a therapist who got up and picked up this book and showed you the, the description of narcissistic personality disorder. I'm just thinking how lucky you are that you found the, a therapist who recognized the signs of that because I think that there are a lot of therapists who would have just said, oh, just try to work it out or, um, or, you know, let's bring him in here. Let's try to talk, you know, or something like that. And I want Dr. Romani to weigh in on that. Um, and what your thoughts are on that, because, you know, from my perspective as a lay person in that field, I think, well, how lucky she was, she found the right therapist early on. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, Tina, in your case, absolutely, it was it was really good fortune. I mean, I would say that was like a one in ten shot that you would have been sitting in a room with a therapist who was willing to call the pattern out as what it was. And I've always been a big believer, and in the majority of the work I've been doing around sort of narcissistic abuse survivorship, is that the quicker people got information the more likely they were to make sense on it, of it. Now, people say, why is that? Why can't the therapist just call this person out? Had I known this a long time ago, this would have been useful. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, and a lot of them are probably you know, more detailed than anyone wants to hear. But in the world of, first of all, most therapists, psychologists, MFTs, social workers, even psychiatrists are not trained heavily in these patterns, believe it or not. Like I actually got some of my training by luck because of a supervisor I had while I was at UCLA. The rest of it was a lot of being self-taught and having these cases. But I was actually very struck by how little training. We, never, we don't get a course in this. We don't get a course in narcissistic personality. We don't even get a course in personality disorders. So A, it's not part of our teaching. B, there's a tremendous reluctance in the field to make too much commentary about somebody who's not in the session. I actually don't agree with that because I don't think we all live in vacuums. I think there's things happening around us. And I think it's really incumbent on a therapist to say, maybe, I mean, listen, I think that we can, yes, we cannot diagnose someone we haven't met for a variety of reasons, but we sure as heck can comment on their patterns. We can certainly say, well, that didn't seem like a very nice thing. Now, if you expand that out a little bit, say these patterns you're describing to the degree they're accurate, and I'm assuming they are, are consistent with these patterns. I mean, I think we can do that. And for me, the awakening I'm trying to create in the therapeutic community is talk about this with your clients. You're not a bad person, you're not judging, but we've got to open up the lens. And, and Tina, you did have a unique experience in that I have, I have clients come in and within 10 minutes, I'm like, yeah, we got that narcissism piece down now. How about you? And then yeah. we them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what really struck me too, how lucky you were to have found the right person that, like right away. So Dr. Romani, would you say if somebody is, you know, they've done the reading, they've done the research, they've read your books, they've watched, you know, your videos or, or they, mm -hmm. they, and they're pretty sure that that's what they're dealing with. And mm -hmm. they go into a therapist's office and the therapist says, no, it's not a narcissist. You're, you're just being um, overreactive mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, you're just throwing the term around because you've heard it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand mm -hmm. times now. Um, what would you say? Go, keep on going, find a different therapist. Here's the other, it's never going to be that black and white, Rebecca. It's not like the therapist can say, no, it's not that. 
what the therapist may often do is engage in this sort of like backpedaling where they'll say, well, your partner did have a history of trauma. And some of this may be associated with trauma, which is often true. But by doing that, they're already activating something in the person who went to this narcissistic relationship, who's been making excuses for this person for one year, five years, 20 years, 50 years. They did go through trauma. They did have a hard childhood. So the, the therapist then ends up almost re-trapping the client. I would say that when you know this and you feel comfortable in this and your therapist at a minimum, even if they won't call the person out as a narcissist, but they're not willing to call the pattern out as toxic, find a new therapist. I, I mean, it is amazing. I'm feeling, oh, I don't want to. It's A, it's a nuisance to find a therapist, but B, you don't like what that therapist is saying. You don't feel comfortable. Get out and find someone else. I tell people that all the time. You don't like me. I'm good with that. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I want you to grow. But I think that's the other problem is it's not as like, ah, they're not a narcissist. They try to backpedal and that confuses the client who already is confused coming into the office. Yeah. And I would say the same thing with lawyers. I mean, it's really, really hard to find lawyers who understand narcissism. I just spoke to a new client for my law practice this morning who's been dealing with a narcissist. I mean, you know, five minutes into the conversation, I could tell that her ex-husband was a flaming narcissist. And, um, you know, her the lawyer that she has is just kind of being, you know, sort of, well, we don't need to, you know, be so aggressive right away. Let's wait and see. Um, and then that just gives the narcissist a lot lots of room yeah. to just keep on going. And so, you know, so one of the things, you know, just so I can comment a little bit on how narcissists become problematic in divorces right away, just listening to what Tina was saying is, you know, once the divorce is filed, even if they file, it does trigger that narcissistic rage. And so they start in on all of these things that they're going to try to project that you're the bad person, they're the good one, that um, so they start gaslighting, they start obstructing, they start like, you know, no the discovery will be uh, filed on time. You know, you're going to have to go through 50,000 hoops to go get it. Um, they're going to lie about everything. They're going to, you know, send text messages that confirm things, you know, conversations that never took place. Um, they're going to start in on the smear campaign, telling everybody that, you know, you, she, you know, you were always a drunk or you were a terrible mother, um, you know, and, and, and so they start engaging in these manipulation tactics right away to try to manipulate the system, meaning the judges, the lawyers, the mediators, and anybody else that may be involved, whether it's a custody evaluator or even a forensic accountant, you know, it doesn't really matter who it is. But if this person is involved somehow in this case, they want to be darn sure that they're the ones that come out looking fantastic and, and amazing. And the other person looks like the complete loser. And, and it's not just, you know, the end game there, there's, you know, you keep, as a reasonable person will go, well, what is it that they want? And I'll just give it to them. You know, there, there is no what they want. What they want is to continue to feed their, their need for narcissistic supply by controlling you and manipulating you and making you look bad and triangulating and doing all the things. They grab their flying monkeys and get them all on their side and um, you know, so that you think that you're going to be alone, so that you think that no one's going to believe you, that everyone's going to believe their lies. And so you as the target sit there and go, well, I can't win. There's nothing I can do to win. I, you know, this person is going to control the entire process. There's, I, I, I don't have the money. I don't have the stamina. I don't have the you know, the time, I, 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 the energy, the mental capacity, <laughs> you know, name it. Right. It's so, right. um, so, you know, um, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the types of tricks that your former husband played in the divorce. And, and then we can talk about, um, you know, what's going on with them psychologically from the psychological perspective when all that's happening. Right. You know, I know that very quickly, um, he weaponized my children. He, you know, he knew that that was the one way to hurt me. He knew that that was my biggest button. I always tell people, figure out what their biggest buttons are, their biggest triggers. I know you call it leverage and, you know, that type of thing. And that, you know, it's so true. Um, you know, I knew very early on that money was his button. Um, one of the things I was up against is that I wasn't, I've always maintained my custody battle wasn't just with him, it was with his mom. 
Oh, he was yeah. with his dad who both had standings in our community. They had founded a local Catholic high school. Um, they had, you know, their roots in pretty deep here. And so he went on a smear campaign telling, you know, we were active in the business community, telling everybody that I had, you know, had affairs. I've never cheated on anyone in my life. <laughs> I just, it's, you know, and so it was painful at the time, but, you know, he knew that my kids were the way to hurt me. And so not telling them, not telling me where they were going to be on visits, you know, he would give me addresses and I, you know, they were always in gated communities, so I couldn't access the house. But I remember having a realtor friend take me in because I knew he was lying about where he was keeping my kids and I was completely distraught. Um, we would go to the address and it would be an empty dirt lot in a gated community. And, oh, you know, God. and the, and the court just kept, kept giving him so much grace, you know, they give me almost like he had just made a mistake giving me the address. And then it would be two or three different fake addresses to where the court finally started cracking down on him. But, you know, we, the court in the beginning for the first, I'd say two years lumped us both into the high conflict category. And it's very I didn't, common. Absolutely. And so, you know, we would go into the courtroom and the judge would look at me and go, Swithin, what are you on the docket for today? And I'd be like, well, like I'm here to protect my kids. And we were in court a lot. 2012, I filed, I took him to court 13 different times. And my mentality was, if you're not going to protect my kids this month, I'm going to just keep coming back over and over again because I need to lay my head down on that pillow knowing that I've done everything in my power this week to protect them. And he was putting them in dangerous situations and, you know, never knowing where they were. He has um, family members who are very dysfunctional. It was a big part of my battle trying to protect my kids from people in his family. And um, so, you know, he, he had a high off of, you know, using them to just torment me and, and it was painful. You know, I, I'm so thankful that we aligned with therapists early on for my kids, even who understood what I was up against. I know how blessed I am with that because, and I do feel that I, you know, so much of it is in how you present yourself. And I was very careful to remove myself from the conflict and tell them, I don't care if you believe his story or my story. That's not what I'm here for. I need my little girls to have tools to navigate what I'm having a hard time navigating as a 40 year old woman, um, you know, and, and so I'm incredibly thankful that we had people, but you know, that wasn't always the case. We went through two full custody evaluations here in California um, minors counsel was appointed. I had CPS involved in my case three times and 90% of those people completely failed my kids. Um, you know, and, and my battle so much. Tell oh, more ahead. about that. Like in what way, how did they fail them? You know, CPS, in my opinion, the most broken agency in this whole family court arena. Um, you know, my kids were almost drowned in a swimming pool to I feel like my ex-husband is more in the sociopathic category. Um, to this day, I feel like it was not accidental oh, that they almost drowned. And he admitted that they almost drowned. CPS was called. They gave him a pamphlet on pool safety and um, un closed it unfounded, even though he admitted that they almost drowned. He left my daughter in a car for 45 minutes while he watched a triathlon on TV in a gym when she had just been released from the hospital after having a 45 minute seizure with orders to never leave her alone, she was four. And he admitted that he left her in a car with the windows cracked for 45 minutes. And they gave him a slap on the wrist and set our hand and said, um, you know, let's talk about car safety. You can't leave kids in a car. And they closed it unfounded. So was this before or after the pool incident? I mean, come that on. was before that was before the pool incident. And then he physically assaulted my, my older daughter when she was seven, grabbed her by the arm. Um, we went, I went to the police station with her. 
marked it as unfounded. They, they did label him a moderate risk, <laughs> but they did nothing. And so, you know, the, it just, you know, in our first custody evaluation, I was so new into this and, and still had not connected all of the dots that the reason my case was so high conflict was because he was a narcissist. I just thought, what the hell? What I just feel like I don't even understand. I'm in some warped reality. And, um, you know, the first custody evaluator, I was not, at that point, I hadn't established patterns of behavior to truly explain to her what was going on and to articulate the issues. And she was just, you know, a lot of them, the second they get a case, their goal is to close it and be done with it. And they don't really do the work. And I think that you know, the threshold of what's acceptable when it comes to parenting for me is a heck of a lot different than the rest of the family court system. Well, I think the problem with anything like CPS or, or you know, agencies like that is that they're so used to seeing, you know, the kids who are living in complete squalor, you know, they're just used to going in, let's check to make sure there's food in the refrigerator um, and, you know, something like that. And so when they see, you know, uh, upper middle class or middle class family who the parents are going through a bad divorce, it's like, here we go again. You know, they're just trying to use uh, us as leverage to try to gain some kind of, you know, advantage in the divorce and let's just get this thing off of our thing. And it's the same thing with judges, quite frankly. I mean, judges are evaluated based on how quickly they move their cases off their docket. They're also evaluated on how often they're appealed and, and they have way too much uh, way too many cases on their docket. They're already super backlogged and, you know, hundreds of cases are being filed every single month in every single jurisdiction, maybe even thousands, depending on where people live. And, you know, there's only a handful of judges on the family law bench. Most of the cases, most of the judges who sit on the family law bench don't even want to be on the family law bench. You know, they're rotated uh, through different um, sections of the court system. And, you know, the family law is the one that nobody wants. Uh, and so, you know, there's a few family law judges that are devoted to family law and they stay in the family law um, arena for a long time. And then those are the ones that end up writing, you know, uh, textbooks and things like that. But for the most part, um, and there are a few that were family law attorneys, but for the most part, you're getting judges who don't understand family law. They, they don't want to be there. They have too many cases and they just want to move them along. And they just see two people who are fighting. They're just like, oh, here we go again. Two people who are fighting. And, uh, and I you think know. a lot of them are so highly narcissistic themselves True. that they can't even recognize the issues in front of them because it so closely relates to who they are. Oh, that's so true too. Thanks for watching part one of this incredible conversation with Dr. Romani and Tina Swithin. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell. And if you want more support and you're ready for connecting with other people who are dealing with the same thing that you are, make sure you join my free Facebook group. It's called Narcissist Negotiators, and I will drop a link to that below so you can just go ahead and join it. And if you haven't grabbed my Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet, now's a good time to do that too. And I will uh, drop a link to that below as well. And that's it for today. Remember, today is a great day to start negotiating your best life. And I will see you in the next video.